So for everyone who's on right now, we'll, we'll be starting in about a minute or two. Just give people uh, another couple minutes to get online and then, and then we'll start. But just so you know, we've started uh, recording the session now. And the recording will be available online uh, at Aggie Video and eventually at YouTube as well. But uh, I think right now, definitely at Aggie Video. Um, and we'll put the link for that in the chat a little bit later during the session. It's actually there now. Thank you, Caroline. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a little bit after two o'clock. I'd like to welcome everybody to this edition of Office Hours with Dave and Anita. Uh, after a, almost a two month hiatus, we're, we're back at least for one more session prior to uh, everybody getting into the thick of harvest if you haven't already been into the thick of harvest. So we appreciate all of you coming. Um, this session is being recorded. It will be uh, posted on Aggie Video by sometime in the next week or so. The, the link for that is in the chat already. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for posting it there. Um, so my name is Dave Block. Uh, I'm chair of the department and one of the hosts of the program. Anita Oberholster, at least on my screen, is in the box just below me. She may be in another box on your screen. <laughs> and uh, the topic of our session today is uh, the new great varieties that um, Professor Andy Walker has released recently that are Pierce disease resistant. And um, after I introduce him, he's gonna give a, a brief, probably about a 20 minute or so talk um, on his work. And then the rest of the time, we'll open it up for questions. So let me introduce Andy. Uh, Professor Andy Walker received, I guess it's the, the trifecta here of degrees from UC Davis, his bachelor's, his master's and his PhD from UC Davis in botany, horticulture, and viticulture and genetics, respectively. Um, after finishing his PhD, he was appointed to the faculty of the Department of Viticulture and Enology in 1989 and has been with us ever since. He's held the Louis P. Martini Endowed Chair in Viticulture uh, for a number of years and now currently holds the Louise Rossi Endowed Chair in Viticulture and Enology. Andy's lab has focused on grape breeding for pretty much his whole time here. He's worked on breeding uh, resistance to pests, um, and this is for rootstocks and uh, fruiting varieties. Uh, and more recently, his work has, has looked at breeding uh, salt tolerance and drought tolerance into uh, grapevine uh, plant material. He's used uh, uh, basically um, traditional breeding, but with a heavy dose of genetics and genetic markers to direct and speed up that approach and has released um, quite the number of uh, different rootstocks and fruiting varieties over uh, the last 10 years or so um, that are becoming more and more widely used. What we'd like to focus on today is the most recent um, varieties that Andy has released for varieties that are Pierce's disease resistant. And so, as I said, we're going to have him talk about those varieties first, and then um, we'll open it up to questions and discussions, uh, discussion as always. For those of you who haven't joined us before, if you have a question along the way, feel free to type it into chat. If you click on the chat button on the bottom, um, if you click on the participants panel, it'll come up on the side. You also have the opportunity there to click on the little blue raise hand or just unmute yourself and start talking. We're informal here. So we're whatever way you feel comfortable asking your questions, um, do so. And uh, Anita and I will also be reading questions off of uh, the chat. So you don't have to if you don't want to. 
So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Andy to talk about his most recent research in the area of disease resistance. So I chair my, there we go. All the instructions, it works better that way. Good afternoon. So as Dave said, I've been here for a while. I'll try to give you some idea of what we were doing for that time period. Um, the PD resistant varieties are a culmination of about 30 plus years of work. So it's a, <laughs> it takes a little time to get these things through the process. Um, and they have great potential, I think, and I'll talk a bit about them. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about Pierce's disease. We'll accept the fact that it's caused by a bacteria and that it's vectored by large leaf hoppers. Uh, and it has an amazing and very complicated relationship with the whole ecology of the southern states and the west coast as well. No one's quite sure what causes it to flare up and, and subdue at the same time in these oscillating cycles, but it has frequently over the, over the many years it's been around. Um, this work is not mine alone, of course. I, I mostly fundraise and give talks and, <laughs> and frantically write stuff as fast as I can. Um, but I enjoy being on the field as much as possible, and, and that's been a, a great pleasure to be able to do a lot of this stuff. Alan Tencher is my, my primary assistant breeder who's been working on PD with me for quite some time, and Samara Riaz does most of the molecular backup work on, on uh, uh, our genetic and molecular breeding efforts. And Cecilia Guerrero has been working very diligently for many, many years trying to figure out what this damn gene is and how it works, and uh, we still haven't got there, but we're getting closer. I think a lot closer. And Rong Hu has been instrumental and uh, very important in all of our uh, lab-based lab efforts. And Nina Romero is an amazing uh, propagation expert and organizer and, and coordinator. And she's been in charge of the greenhouse and field for many years. Most of the funding's come from the PD GWIS board. That's an assessment that you who are growers just recently paid into and thank you. It continues it on for, for another cycle. Uh, and it's, it's been really critical. One of the reasons PD work hasn't gotten very far uh, in many areas or until recent, more recently was it wasn't a consistent funding base. And with the, the PD GWIS board, it really allowed it, a lot of long-term projects to, to make progress as, as things went on. And as Dave said already, a lot of, a lot of my money is used, to, um, a lot of my endowment money is used to collect grapes and understand the botany and, and the basis of a lot of these materials that, that I can't, I don't get funding for from other places. So it's been very, very important, the Rossi chair and the Marquini chair in the past. And of course, the AVF was the, was the instigator of this. Back in about 93 or 4, they got uh, all the scientists working on Pierce disease together and put them in a big room and said, don't come out to you and figure out a solution. And we didn't, didn't figure out a solution, but it, it was an important first step in getting a lot of different ideas together and, and projects uh, moving forwards. OK, so when North America was invaded by, by the Spaniards and others <laughs> over time, they brought grapes with them. And we know that they did that now. Uh, so 500 years ago, we were growing vinifera in, in, in the New World. And uh, in the southern part of that New World, they all died of Pierce's disease. And in the northern part of that New World, they, they died of, of, the, of the mildew diseases, downy mildew and powdery mildew and a bunch of other rot diseases. So it wasn't really very successful because although we do have somewhere between 20 and 30 different wild species and cultivars made from those species and uh, that, that are still used as hobbyist plants primarily around the country and resist all those local diseases. Um, they really don't taste the same as vinifera and vinifera didn't really have a chance to survive these spots. Uh, so eventually they began to think about how that would happen, how they would bring vinifera in and some of the consequences of bringing vinifera, the, the cultivated European wine grape, uh, was that it, that it artificially hybridized with um, uh, wild species and, and that occurred because the wild species are either male flowered and female flowered, so pollen from vinifera vines blew in and made crosses. And, and they weren't done inadvertently, they were done inadvertently, uh, we think at first. And later on, it became more directed over time. And we still use one of those famous crosses that occurred spontaneously. It's called Lenoir or Jacques or Black Spanish. Uh, and it makes a horrible wine. It makes a reasonable port, uh, but not much of a wine. And uh, it's still grown across the southern United States from Florida to Texas. And it's, it's the predominant red wine grape uh, grown in that area that's, that's able to survive for any more than a few years. Uh, about 100 years of breeding was always hindered by the fact that, that um, most of the genetic resistances were controlled by multiple genes, not a single gene. So it was hard to get all the different loci and different genes in coordination to actually cause resistance at the same time, bringing forward better quality flavors and wine quality. 
That was the big issue. So we really couldn't get over the hump. And in fact, the most famous white wine grape that's PD resistant is called Blanc de Bois. And its last parent was Cardinal, an old uh, Muscatty table grape from many, many years ago. So it wasn't even an effort to <laughs> produce wine grapes, nor, nor does it produce exceptionally good wine either. We were fortunate enough to find and sort of stumble upon this B4317, which is a, a, a selection of uh, Vitus Arizonica uh, from Monterey, Mexico. And in fact, it grows all across the, the southern border into New Mexico and Arizona and to Texas and various spots. And we've been finding various forms of that. And we found this one and it turned out to have a dominant gene for resistance. So whatever you cross to that plant, doesn't matter what you cross to it, it's 100% resistant progeny. So we can then go through and find a resistant plant that has that resistance gene. And when you cross that again to a, a better quality wine grape, 50% of the progeny will be, will be resistant and, uh, and you have a great chance of finding good quality of each cycle of the, of the breeding program. So we were able to do that and move it forwards. And I'll tell you a bit more about that as we go. That plant was collected by Olmo in 1961 in Mexico. And uh, we've since collected uh, probably about 3,000 different accessions of wild grape species from across the southern United States and um, focusing on, on all the traits that Dave mentioned earlier on primarily. Um, and we have about 1,000 in the vineyard now still that are, that are a fairly important use, I think, over time. So this funny looking thing are two, is, is the chromosome, chromosome 14 in grape, and we've mapped resistance to it. So we know where it exists. And we have two different forms of the map. The one we use for, for breeding is a genetic map and it's, st it's statistical and it, it takes these pieces of DNA and relates them to each other uh, multiple times. And in the end, if you have the presence of that, of that marker for resistance, that, so we can take that seedling and grind it up and look for the markers. And uh, if we find that one that says PDR1B, we know that it's going to be resistant. If, more importantly, if it doesn't have it, we throw it away <laughs> because we don't want to waste our time evaluating progeny that doesn't have the potential for resistance. So those all go away and we focus all our efforts on breeding for the, for the quality ones. We can also find scale map this thing, which we've done, and I'll get, tell you the consequences of that as we go along. Um, and we can actually physically map that gene. So we can actually know where that DNA sequence is and pluck it out and put it in some of the background and see if it works. And the, the intent here is not to genetically modify grape, which could be done, but it is, it is not that. The intent is to figure out how this works, uh, if it works, how long it'll be stable. And when we do this classically, when we take two different plants, we're actually selecting for a phenotype, which means a behavior or, or a whole phenomenon. If we're doing this molecularly, we're selecting for a very small piece of DNA. And it turns out virtually nothing works from a very small piece of DNA. It always works in concert with all sorts of other different spots on the, in the genome. Uh, and that's what goes on here too. So when, when we make those crosses uh, in a classical sense and, and evaluate for resistance, we're getting far more than we bargained for. If we did it through genetic engineering, we may not actually get an effect. And in fact, let me just go here for a second. I'll come back to that in a second. Poor Cecilia Guerra has been doing this for 10 years, trying to figure out what that little snippet of DNA does. And until this last year, we haven't, been, haven't had any responses. So we took that gene, we, we sequenced it, we put it back into susceptible grapes, and they weren't resistant. And that's no mean feat. It takes a year to do that at a time. And uh, we went back and tried it again and again, and we took larger pieces of DNA and smaller pieces of DNA, and we coupled with other things, and we used, we used native promoters. So we finally, actually this year, found resistance. And, and uh, we don't know quite what it does yet, and it doesn't do it very well either. So. <laughs> When we take the first generation plants, we get symptoms when we inoculate these plants. We get foliar symptoms, we get cane symptoms, the plants die back. But if they have this RGA14, this is the piece of DNA we've been chasing for many, many years. If they have that little piece of DNA, the plants regrow and they survive. So that's, it may actually work. So we'll see over time. The next me will figure this out. It's not gonna be me, uh, but, it, but some, the next, next batch of people can figure out why this thing is actually working. So let's go back to this one, that's more important. So how are we using this molecular technique to speed up breeding? Well, first of all, it was a horticultural effort that really was most, most important. We were able to take grapes from a seedling and grow them very rapidly in one year with a lot of training, a lot of horticultural effort to really force them to bloom the following year. And if you read a book about grape breeding or any woody plant breeding, it always says it's not practical because it takes too long to read. <laughs> well, that's because they, they weren't applying any of these tricks. Uh, and you, if you do apply them, you can get them to bloom within two years. Uh, and uh, historically, it would have been five to eight years. 
So if you think about the poor breeder with you know, a five, eight year cycle between, okay, this is the best plant I have from this cycle of the, of the crosses. I'll cross it back to something else and then wait another eight years before I make that decision or before they even flower uh, enough. It's really a very slow process. So we forced them into bloom in this rapid cycle. And we had the markers that told us which ones were resistant and which ones were susceptible. And we used the markers to throw away all the susceptible plants so that we ended up with just a population of, of high quality, potentially high quality, but also uh, very resistant plants. Now, as most things, it's more complicated than that. It's, that it always is. Uh, and it turns out resistance uh, is a broad spectrum of reactions. None of the plants die, but quite a few of them are tolerant and they host the bacteria. So when they get fed upon or we inoculate them artificially, there's actually a lot of bacteria in them, but the plant doesn't show symptoms. From some perspectives, that's very good. From a PD perspective, that's very bad because those plants, the resistant plants or the tolerant plants would act as vectors and conduits for the bacteria to move further from the native habitat in the vineyards. So we, we purposely decided we wanted the most, absolutely most resistant plants to move forward. And that was the most important thing. It wasn't wine quality, it wasn't fruit quality, it wasn't appearance of the vine and the shoots. It was the, they were highly, highly resistant. So we took only those plants and advanced them forwards. So that's how we sort of laid this together. So if we take that first cross, we have the wild species and we have vinifera and we cross them together and those plants are half vinifera. Okay, we take the best one of those, but highly, highly resistant, cross it back to vinifera, and it's then 75% vinifera. And if we do that again, it's 88% vinifera. If we do that again, it's 94%. And if we do it again, it's 97%. And that's what we've done to try to get to that point where it's almost completely vinifera through classical breeding, and we still have expression and presence of the resistance gene in them. That's, that's, that's the key aspect of this whole thing. And if you had to do that on eight year cycles, it would take 50 years <laughs> and you'd lose the interest of the breeder for sure. And the funding agencies for that matter as well. Okay, so our goal was to take, take this strategy and get as many populations through to, with high quality of vinifera backgrounds to this 97% vinifera level. And another neat thing about this is if you're thinking about how this works, if we cross it back to a resistant parent, why not just keep crossing it back to Chardonnay or to Cabernet each generation and move them ahead more rapidly? And the problem is you can't do that because of inbreeding depression. Grapes are highly heterozygous and it's the same consequence of marrying your brothers and sisters is the exact same consequence of mating those plants together and, and deriving progeny. If, if you get any at all, it's usually abnormal. So you have to switch that vinifera parent in each one of the generations. And, and we've done that. But in that last cross, that progeny that you made, which is now 97% vinifera, is 50% that last vinifera variety you used. And that has a remarkable influence on how that population looks like and the wine quality and fruit quality and all the rest. And so we targeted the top international varieties as our, as our key parents for this last generation. And we've since then made many, many more generations. This, this, these populations we're gonna talk about today were from 19, 2009. Uh, and we've looked much more broadly across international varieties and, and more regionally important varieties too. Okay, so we went through and did all that. We've also tried to find the resistance from other sources of, of the Vitis arizonica and related plants. And they're much more complicated, it's frustrating. And the ones that are resistant are exactly the same in terms of that source of resistance. <laughs> and we've gone now over thousands of miles and, and uh, many, many populations. And that resistance gene is pretty st stable and consistent. That's too bad, it's good in one sense, but it's too bad in another because we want to take multiple forms of resistance and put them together in one background so they resist the disease more effectively over time. Okay. So that's where we're at now. And we've also now began to think about how to do this with powdery mildew. And we're partway through that process. We're making the first 95% PD plus powdery mildew resistant wines this year. Uh, so we'll have some idea whether they're useful or not. Well, that's the other thing. So if you had to make wine in each of those generations, that would be more complicated, right? So you'd have to actually decide which plant is best multiply it so you have at least 10 plants, get enough fermentable fruit, make some decisions about that, and it takes a long time, at least three to four years. So that's where a lot of that uh, delay is in the whole process. And we knew before we started that anything we made that wasn't at least 90% vinifera was going to be poor quality because we'd already tried mines and made wines at, at, at that sort of level over, over the years. So we ignored the winemaking part. We made a few here and there, but we essentially just looked for resistance and to get it back into a highly vinifera background. So we went from stuff like that. Uh, what, I don't know what side that's for you. Is that your left side? It's my left side. That little cluster up here, the little tiny P-shaped fruit, that's Vitis arizonica bivinifera. 
It tastes a lot like pepper and grass and, uh, and it's astringent and it's not very sweet and it's not, not very pleasant at all, but it has tremendous color. And that's partly from this Vitus Arizonica background. Uh, it has nothing else to, as an attribute except for its resistance. So it's a, it's a different sort of plant, very peculiar material. And over the years, over 12 years, we're able to bring it forward to something that looks, acts, and tastes like vinifera. And when I say it acts like vinifera, I mean that. Uh, it's, it's interesting, as you make these wild crosses over the years, the plants become less and less wild in appearance and more and more vinifera in appearance. It's sort of, sort of neat. Uh, and even the leaves change markedly from things that look sort of peculiar and odd, off type, uh, to things that really look normal. Uh, and it follows that. And that's all bringing all those genes together and having them sort of work, work in the same packages is, is, the, is the key to this. Um, so at this point, as we make, got to that level, we started then selecting for quality. And we had to make wines and we had to bring winemakers together and we had to have them taste with us. And when we tasted the stuff at the 94%, and we found that there was a break point between poor quality and high quality. It's nice with red wine grapes because we've already sort of defined one of their primary quality characters as color, which may or may not be true, frankly. Uh, it's not, not my highest opinion about what a wine should be, just dark black purple, that's a different opinion. But we, we knew we could then, we could select for diglucoside anthocyanins. And these are the anthocyanins that, that, that give you a bluish cast, not a nice purple red cast. And if you take a, a, a glass of hybrid wine, so if you're tasting wines across the south, I pity you, but first of all, but if, if you keep going across the south and then up to the north, the same sort of thing goes on. You, you can actually evaluate those wines after you finish drinking. And you should twirl the, what, the, the dregs in the glass a little bit. You'll notice they're blue, they're not purple. And you'll take a sniff of them and you'll realize, wow, I just finished drinking that. It's not all that pleasant. So the, the, the aroma is off and the color is, is way off. And that, that uh, off type, appearance and, and uh, aspect goes away at this 94%. So that, that's sort of neat as a, as, a, as a guide for us later on. All right, so here are the wines. Uh, the first one is this 09338-16. That's we were releasing two. We finished releasing two whites and, and three reds. And this is a Caminante Blanc and it's, it's a half Cabernet Sauvignon. Remember Cabernet Sauvignon has a white parent, so it's not that strange that it should be a white grape. And we've gone through and done a lot of categorization of these things. If you want little um, uh, cheat sheets on them, I can send that to you if you drop me an email somewhere. Um, and it tells you what sort of wine parameters they have as well. So we've done a lot of wine tasting, a lot of valuation, and a lot of testing to these materials. And they were made, that cross was made in 2009. So I have a, when, when, I, when I was first um, hired, Harold almost took me aside and told me, now your naming structure for your, your uh, seedlings is not secure enough. And I said, what? <laughs> because anybody could figure out that that was 2009, your 338th cross and the 16th seedling. And I said, yeah, and what good would that do them? And uh, it doesn't do them any good at all, of course, unless they have those plant materials. Um, and he said, well, it's, it's better to be more secretive. So he was very secretive. I've not been very secretive about these materials and, and still no one's stolen them from me at this point, which is, which is good. Uh, so this was made quite a while ago, and, and we sent them to nurseries starting two years ago, three years ago, I guess now. They started bulking them up, and the first commercial sales of any note were this year. And in fact, last year, there were about 19,000 total vines from these fine varieties uh, that were sold, if, if my reckoning with the nurseries is, is correct. Um, so they've been out and running, and, and they're getting some good uh, feedback from them. Their people are quite happy with their quality. Uh, they have typical vinifera characters. One of the first questions I get when someone realizes these are PD resistant is, well, can I grow them in the East? And I say, well, you certainly you can. And then you can grow them in the South as well, whatever you like, and they'll resist Pierce's disease. The primary reason those vines don't survive is Pierce's disease. But the secondary reason is you get tired of spraying them for all the mildew diseases and all the fu fungal rots and all the bunch rots that occur. So eventually you just give up. Uh, the plants don't die from Pierce's disease, they die from neglect in those situations. So remember on the East Coast, uh, you can spray every, every seven days, every 10 days, and it's still not often enough oftentimes. So it's a, it's a bit tricky to maintain those plants. The West is definitely the place to be growing grapevines, though, for sure, nice dry summer climates. So these survive PD and they survive, uh, if you spray them, they, 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 will, they will tolerate um, powdery mildews and, and downy mildews as well in those situations. There is a, in the earlier generations, there were some, some of these plants actually had fairly good resistance to foliar diseases as well, uh, but it was coupled with poor quality and they didn't really seem to go far, far forwards. So there's the Caminante Blanc. There's the Ambulo Blanc and uh, same, same year, same generation, not a sibling, 
uh, but, but closely related, also 50% Cabernet. Uh, and this, this plant, let, let me go ahead and tell you about these guys. So the, the 16 is very much like Sauvignon Blanc. And in fact, I was at a tasting last Friday, uh, went over to Silverado Cellars, and John Emmerich wanted to look at some of these uh, crosses, and I brought a bunch of the wines over and we tasted through them. And then they did a, a, a tasting of high-end high -end Sauvignon Blancs, including a $100 bottle of Isley Sauvignon Blanc. I said, oh my goodness, it'll be interesting to see how these compare. And they compared very well, <laughs> which was sort of shocking. And they, they were as shocked or more so than I was because we made these wines at small scale again, at about a five to 10 gallon level, uh, not, not at a, high, not at a, a com commercial scale. Okay, so there's the Sauvignon Blanc-like one. Uh, Ambulo Blanc is a bit more like Chardonnay. And I say that because Chardonnay often doesn't have much of a character to it, <laughs> but it's, it's a bit more neutral. Uh, it doesn't really have any distinctive uh, character to it uh, in many, many ways. And it's been well appreciated. Both these wines have been well appreciated. The Caminari is the first of the reds. And this is one of the earlier generation ones, a 94% uh, red, red grape. And this is one that uh, is, is about 50% Petit Syrah and has a lot of petite characteristics to it. It has a nice peppery character. It has a nice tannin structure, very nice color. Uh, and it's been uh, a favorite of some. Chuck Wagner from Camus has planted a lot of this and is very excited about it as a, as a wine grape, as a, even a varietal wine grape. If, if we can't change the name, he might change it for us, I guess. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's done well. It's it very promising. Paseante Noir is... Uh, is one that, that is most like Zinfandel to me. Uh, it's really more of a softer red in, in a fashion. Uh, it's a bit, bit more um, Pinot or, or, or Zin-like and less Cab-like. Uh, and it's done pretty well. It's been, it's been taken off again. It's, it's one that uh, Chuck Wagner has been very, very happy about. And Arante Noir is one of the ones that I didn't like that well because it was a very strong and stringent red uh, that was very over, overly Cab-like in many ways, highly productive. Uh, and the people who are growing this are thinking this is going to be a great blending grape. And that's really what the, the philosophy was originally was to take, say, we can use these all to, to take advantage of the blending laws that, so you don't have to have a varietal labeling for this essentially. It can be blended in with Cabernet in this case or with Zinfandel in the other case. And you'd be able to recoup that, that bit of your property where nothing seems to grow ever because of the Pierce disease. And you could blend it in with whatever else you'd like to, to uh, disguise the fact that you're growing hybrid grapes, I guess. Okay, so those are the five grapes that we, we, we released. And again, about uh, 19,000 were sold last year. Um, 7,000, maybe more like 10,000 went to Texas. <laughs> so Texas was one of the big, uh, big uh, original proponents and, and have been pushing this for quite some time too. And Chuck Weiger's plantings are the biggest here. And we have plantings in Ojai and Sonoma and quite a few of them across Napa now. And, and um, at many high-end spots and sort of intermediate spots. And this next year, there will finally be enough wood where the nurseries can take decent size orders. There hasn't been enough wood. The nurseries haven't bulked the material up as rapidly as I would have hoped. And again, they didn't want to have to plant a bunch of vines and not, not be able to sell them. So they're, they're waiting for demand to come up. So if you have demand for these grapes, you should make, yourself, make your voices heard and the nurses will plant more. Uh, otherwise, they'll, they'll just leave it the same way it is. So we're now trying to broaden the background of nifer-like characters in these things. Again, with acidity, color, tannins, aromatics, ripening profiles. We've made crosses to sort of address all those and we have populations in the field. They're all about 97 plus percent at this point uh, that we're working through. And it takes a long time to work them through. It takes a lot longer time to evaluate these things uh, accurately uh, for, for, for wine quality and for fruit quality than it does for, for um, uh, genetics and genetics and, and, and resistance traits as well. Uh, the other big player in this has been ETS Labs, who've been really generous, and they've been doing about 30 special juice samples for us each year, their quality juice parameter samples, and um, run those through, and, and they've been very generous, haven't charged us at all, and been very supportive over the years. So I think it's been a, a very nice partnership between us at this point. So the next, next thing we're looking for is stacking resistance genes. So taking that, that B4317 resistance and adding another form of resistance. That's a single dominant gene. And if you've done any reading about disease resistance and the genetics of the resistance into diseases, you'll find that they break down all the time and they're almost always controlled by single genes. And the, there's always a constant battle between the, the pest and the breeder and the hosts. And we're trying to figure out um, how to overcome that ability or how to augment that ability to resist um, these, these diseases, how, how can we put more resistance genes in one background and really get more effective resistance? 
And um, we were working on that. And as I told you earlier, it's not been easy because we haven't found a lot of diversity in those resistance types. We do have a resistance type that's controlled by multiple genes, uh, but it's harder to breed with. And when, you, when I use that material, I get maybe four or 5% resistant progeny each cycle. And then it's very hard to find the high resistance and the high quality in the same package. Uh, so that's, that's been the, 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 the stumbling block. At the same time, we started to add powder mildew resistance in quite a few years ago. And we've looked at uh, various resistances from all over the country and the world for that matter, and learned a lot more about powder mildew resistance. And we're now starting to move that into these packages too. So in the next couple of years, you'll, you'll probably start seeing uh, the fruits of those labors is, and we'll, we'll bring powdery mildew resistant material. It probably won't be fully resistant. It would be dangerous to put it out in the field and not spray it at all, but we'll probably give it a good early season spray and then a cleanup spray at the end of the season. But we'll ignore those 10 sprays in between. So, so the, the, they're, they're, uh, they, have, they may have great potential too. So we've been doing a lot of work with the mildew resistance genes. These little flagpoles and, and flags are are the resistance are the grape genes and the, the flags are the various uh, loci, various spots where resistance to powdery mildew exists. And we have mildew resistance from North America, uh, from retendifolia, which is something we don't want to talk about. We can talk more about it one later on, but the fruit quality is so terrible and the genetics is so complicated that it's tricky. The most important forms of those resistances may be the Asiatic ones. So those of you who have been through viticulture courses in the past, um, remember, I think, uh, hearing that powdery mildew evolved in North America, and therefore the resistance gene should be in North America. But this turns out to be false. <laughs> so there's something missing this, in, this, uh, in this, this story. We found lots of resistance in Asiatic vitus, and we've done a lot of work on that, some of the earliest work on developing that and characterizing those genes. Uh, the first form of resistance in, in vinifera was found in Central Asia. So how can vinifera be resistant? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and you would think in a typical sense that they're co-evolving together, so they have to form these, these, these resistance genes in that sort of process, but maybe not. Uh, and we've since gone through and looked at about uh, 800 different Central Asian vinifera cultivars and, and wild type, feral type grapes as well, and found about 12 more forms of resistance to powdery mildew that are in vinifera. Why should we care? Well, it's really important because all the other resistances bring forward with them pretty poor fruit quality. And to improve on that fruit quality, if you didn't have to improve on the fruit quality, if, if it was a neutral vinifera sort of background or, or a character to it, uh, then you can move forwards in terms of quality much more rapidly. So um, the world's uh, grape genetics labs, and there's how many? I don't know, uh, 30 or so, let's say, and, and probably more like 500 scientists now working away. The vast majority of that effort is going into figuring out what these mildew genes resist, uh, what these mildew resistance genes are, and how they function, and how they can be manipulated. And each one of those labs wants to genetically engineer these things into a vinifera background, where they wouldn't have to alter, at least to any great extent, that um, that vinifera characteristic and background. And they're going to do that. They're going to have to do that with multiple forms because they've already done it singly, and they don't last very long. These resistance genes are fairly ephemeral and the, the effect of them is fairly ephemeral. And they, they seem to be overcome by different strains of mildew pretty quickly. So armed with that knowledge and with the firm belief that it's better to do it classically if you can anyway, uh, because again, classically breeding these things, we bring, a, we bring, a, uh, bring forward all the associated uh, baggage that's actually the parts that make these genes function well. Uh, so we're bringing those forwards and trying to put them, put them in one package and um, uh, doing that through classical breeding, so we're selecting for a phenotype of behavior again, not necessarily the, the genes themselves. Okay, so that's been working pretty well, and and it's uh, it's exciting to see these things move forward as as quickly as they are. We've also this this is just to give you some idea of all the different wild grapes I've collected over the last thirty years. Um, that was many many hours in the car. I was just thinking about that, and my lower back was hurting on the way in this morning. Uh, but it's a tremendous diversity of material, and they not only resist uh, Pierce disease. They resist uh, mildew to some extent. They resist nematodes fairly effectively. Some of these things resist salt and they'll grow in 12% seawater. Uh, and we've been making crosses with those for rootstocks as well. And uh, uh, we've been coupling these things together as much as we can to, make a, to have a better chance at creating durable resistances as well. And this again will be stuff for my, my uh, uh, successors as, as I retire and depart. Uh, it's going to be nice to be watched over these, these materials and see how they move through the whole, whole process over the next 30 years. There's Ambulo Blanc down at, uh, in, in Ojai. And this is um, 
uh, Adam Tomax Vineyard. He used to work with, with Ojai Vineyards and he worked with, uh, what was the other one? I forget. Now, this is their own wines in here. And he's in a little bowl, but down here at the bottom of this hillside uh, that prevented him from growing grapes. The thing he wanted to do more with his property than anything else was grow grapes. And he hasn't been able to for 10 years. And look at that, they're growing like mad. And he's had intense pressure here. There's tons of sharpshooters everywhere. The vines look great. And this is their first commercial size harvest. So uh, they're, they're ready to roll. They're very happy with it. And Chuck Wagner and Paul Skinner, who have been the proponents in St. Helena, and they have quite a few vines out now, uh, somewhere over 2,000, uh, probably closer to 10 in, in Solano County as well. And they've been making wines and sharing them with us as well at a commercial scale. And, and uh, it's remarkable what you can do with these things, it's just like any other wine at a larger scale versus a small 10 gallon scale. So this is along the Sonoma, uh, this is in St. Helena along the Napa River. And uh, they've taken a lot of that frontage, the river frontage and terraced it. Uh, but what they really have done is created a better Pierce disease habitat in many regards. So he's thinking we can grow grapes along these terraces and they'll, they're resistant and they'll act as a barrier to some sort, uh, some sort to, to the um, infusion of, of Pierce disease and vectors into that rest of the vineyard. Okay, so there they are. That's the, that's the story. Thanks for listening. And uh, if you want those grapes and you haven't ordered them already for next year, you probably should <laughs> because they're going to be gone soon. Um, there are five nurseries, I think, now with them. So Vintage is growing it, Sunridge Nursery is growing them, Nova Vine Nursery is growing them, and the Double A Nursery in Texas and New York is growing them, and there's one more. So, did I say Sunridge? Sunridge Nursery is also um, growing them. Uh, and if you need that information, just send me an email, I'll tell you who to contact there. And again, there's not much because they started with a few potted vines, five or so, small four inch potted vines. They stuck them in the ground, they grew them for a season, and they started multiplying these materials. Uh, and again, they have to make a commitment to really producing them. Um, when I distribute them, I told them, you need 10 acres of each of these things. So you're gonna get, you'll get a uh, couple of hundred cuttings of each of those vines, a couple hundred buds, and you'll be able to put them on rootstocks. And again, they were hesitant because they didn't know if that was true or not. <laughs> not that they couldn't do that, but that they would actually sell these materials. So we're, we're in that lag phase. Well, we, we boost these things up to the beyond an experimental backyard approach to a, to a slightly larger vineyard scale. Are there any questions? I don't know if I can take questions. I can't see my little red buttons. Um, yes, so um, as I'm gonna be starting off with the questions, if anybody else have questions, remember you could just unmute yourself and ask a question. You can type a question into the chat function and I, myself or Dave or Karen can ask the question, uh, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, okay, so Andy, you did, there's a question about the list of nurseries, but you just mentioned it. Uh -huh. Great. So, um, so mostly these... Hey, Anita, Anita, can, yes. can you just have Andy mention them again so we yeah. can put them in chat? Sure. Yeah. So I'll do it slowly too. So Nova Vine, that's in Santa Rosa. Sunridge, which is down in Bakersfield. Uh, I, I think I might have called it Vintage last night, didn't I? It's a wonderful nursery now. They changed their name. Wonderful nursery in Wasco, also down near Bakersfield. One, two, three. And the Double A Nursery in, in New York, if you're from out of the state, they're supplying stuff from the East Coast quite a bit and through Texas over time. And there was one more, I think. Uh, Martinez, Martinez Nursery, but they're a little bit be behind. They're in winters. And um, they're a year behind, so they won't have as much wood uh, initially. Okay. And what can they sell you? They'll sell you potted plants, grafted plants, whatever you, whatever you need. Okay, so, so um, Caroline just typed those in the, in the chat function so people can copy and paste that or write that down there. Um, so first thing, looking at the new grape varieties, it looks like they're basically mostly um, their parents are, if that's the correct word to use, from Vitis vinifera region, but how are they going to be marketed? As, as vinifera or as a... As ah, that's a good question. <laughs> so in, in Europe, they distinguish uh, hybrids between hybrids that are made from a vinifera and a wild species and crosses that are made between two vinifera. So crosses are within vinifera and hybrids are outside of vinifera. Uh, hybrids is a is it's more, it's a more general term. It's anything you you cross together that creates a hybrid grape, um, and so these are technically hybrids from a European perspective. But there's a good thing about that 
and, and that's, it's, it's going to be self-defeating. This, this idea that you can't have hybrid materials is going to be self-defeating because Ruby Red, which was one of Harold Omol's grapes, is 25% rupestris. And it's being sold as pure vinifera, and it clearly is not. And if you ever taste it in, the, in, in, in a tasting of any sort or look at the, the color or smell it <laughs> very critically, it's not very pleasant. Uh, it's there for coloration for, as a denturier. It's not there for inducing quality in, in, the, in terms of anything besides color. Um, so there's a foot in the door, and the, the Germans have already been marketing stuff that's 85 and 90 percent of uh, vinifera as pure vinifera, not even mentioning crossings or, or hybrids at all. It's been legislated as pure vinifera, and most of the world is now becoming more, a little softening a little bit in this whole concept. You know, one of the things that's going to dramatically change viticulture, like everything else, is going to be climate change. And it's going to change the way we actually, what varieties we select and how we develop them. And it's going to be impossible to have the same milieu of varieties, important in 15 or 20 years, 30 years, whatever the number of years is, uh, you are going to have to adapt them. And to actually cut off our noses despite our faces in regard to this hybrid nature, I think is a huge mistake. It's been typical. And where does it come from? It came from the phylloxera crisis. So the first solution to phylloxera was to make hybrid direct producers, things that had resistant roots and produced a lot of crop. A lot of crop because there was no wine, remember? So the primary criteria was make sure these were incredibly fruitful. Uh, and they were. And when they solved the phylloxera crisis through, through rootstocks, it then became clear that they were outcompeting themselves because the hybrids were producing more crop and we wanted to legislate against the hybrids. So they did, they effectively legislated against hybrids in France, you couldn't grow them. Uh, we grow them in the East Coast, we grow them in the Northeast. Uh, they're, they're grown a little bit in Europe to some extent, but there's a very bad feeling about them. <laughs> That's, it's, it's from this historical association with, with phylloxera and the, the lack of ability to compete in those backgrounds too. So we're gonna need those genes and powdery mildew and downy mildew Resistance genes are right, right next. They're coming along very soon. Uh, the next question is, what do they call the GMO versions of these things if they, if they find those genes and extract them? Will those be called well, hybrids in addition to being GMOs? Are they going to be hybrids too? <laughs> yeah, they are. They're going to have another wild species in them. Um, so it's, it, to me, I think it's time we sort of give up on that. Not a, I think the genetically modified stuff has some ethical concern, and, and people can argue about that. Uh, differentially, but the idea that we shouldn't be thinking that these things that are virtually 99%, and we can make them, frankly, 99% vinifera if you want them, <laughs> instead of 97%, it seems ridiculous not to um, to move forward or at least have the tools to move forward more more uh, more cleverly. So, Andy, we have a whole bunch of questions for you okay. in the chat. I'll so maybe, maybe I'll read the first one. We can alternate back and forth. So, how did you trick the vines into flowering and growing grapes the second year? <laughs> so, throughout your seedling grow it up two meters, and that requires graduate students and undergraduate students. Someone has to go out there every week and take off every single lateral bud as soon as it forms. Otherwise, you won't get that rapid upright growth. So that's what we did. And it, and it take, requires a lot of hand passes. And fortunately, unfortunately, graduate student labor or undergraduate labor went from $10 an hour to $15 an hour now. So we can only do 50% as much. <laughs> Not really, we can still afford them. But we plucked them all off. And then when you get it up at two meters, you bend it down at about four and a half to five feet and to tie it in place. And next year, 50% uh, of those plants in the first parts, first efforts to do this will, will flower. And if you, um, if you start selecting for that, you'll get more like 80% over time. So it's, a, it's just a way to trick the hormonal balance of the vine, which is a constant battle between uh, shoot derived and apex derived or phytohormones and root derived ones. And this is a tool that allows you to, to sort of end run that pretty effectively. Okay, I have a question uh, from the chat. Are these adaptable to most rootstocks or are there certain rootstocks that are more compatible? Good question, I don't know. So we've put them <laughs> on maybe six to eight and I, I see no reason to think that there's going to be an issue. Uh, but we also bred PD resistant rootstocks. We haven't released them yet and they have uh, nematode resistance to, um, we don't think we're going to need them. We haven't seen any situation where the bacteria has wiggled its way down into the root system and killed the plant because of that. There was some thought they would, but it turns out the rootstocks are mostly tolerant. They're North American. They grew up with Pearson disease primarily, and they don't really respond as aggressively. Uh, some of them show symptoms, but they don't die. Uh, so we haven't seen that happen, and we, we're thinking it's probably not going to happen. But just in case, <laughs> we've bred those other rootstocks that you would graft on. Um, and we haven't, we haven't released them yet though to, to move them forwards. Can, 
Andy, can you uh, comment on the approximate price per vine for these varieties? Uh, the nurseries determine the price per vine, uh, and the patent office, to some extent, too, determines price per vine. Um, the patent office raised the, the patent royalty that they put on these. So UC owns these. Once I release them, UC owns these plants now. I don't own them anymore. I can, I can uh, say these merchy things about them if I want. <laughs> um, but there's a patent charge of a dollar a plant. And uh, the original normal price for a bench grafted plant at a small backyard scale would be 10 bucks probably. But if you're planting some acreage, it would be three and a quarter plus. So, so it'd be more like four and a quarter instead of three and a quarter commercially. Okay, I'm sorry. So the next question, can you elaborate on what you mean about the single gene resistance uh, grape being ephemeral? Are the resistant vines only resistant for a few years? Yes, and not in PD necessarily, but for instance, in powdery mildew, when we've actually classically bred in some of those resistance genes and you challenge them with a broad array of strains of powdery mildew, you'll find that over time, and that time can be in one year and it can be in a few years, over time, new strains of mildew will be evolving and they'll be able to perform more effectively on that vine than they would originally. And it won't be collapsed entirely, but it'll just be a slow degradation. But the, the gene, if you had more genes, you'd have more resistance mechanisms theoretically, and therefore you'd have less of a chance of that occurring, or that the plant itself would be more durable and stable. So we're trying to head that off by, by doing it first before we have to. But you think the PD resistance will last longer? I don't know, and I hope so. They're, they're, it's been, uh, we've, we've had it inoculated without any symptoms for 20 years now. So um, that, that there's, it's not gonna go away quickly. Uh, and I think, um, I think it's probably gonna last very, very well. If you we went, if you talked about multiple generations of vineyards on the same spot at the same time, the same situation, yeah, it would encourage that to happen perhaps, but I don't think it'll be quick and it'll be, it won't be within that first lifespan. It'll be in the second video lifespan where you start seeing these things probably. Yeah, so um, there's a question, Andy, and uh, can you tell me how you named the varieties? <laughs> I've noticed a traveling walking theme <laughs> and maybe you can also comment on how you get a name approved by whoever needs to approve names. I'll answer the second question first, and you can ponder the first, the, the first one. Um, the, the second answer is the, the names have gone forward to the DTB already uh, about a month ago, and um, uh, they're supposed to be in the approval process. So before you can put Ambulo Blanc on the label, it has to be approved by TTB. And um, they've gone forward now with the help of FPS and Nancy Sweet there, who is a retired judge, to help find true the language and get it through the process more quickly. So hopefully they're going to be approved uh, within the next few few months. Um, do you anticipate that they will grow differently under different talus systems? Uh, no. Uh, well, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so the 94% errante uh, or the, the um, uh, caminante one uh, actually is a little bit weepy, mo but most of them are fairly erect. So um, we can select for a lot of things when we're growing these plants. And we selected, first of all, from the look like vinifera and much like that last parent as we could. We're sort of aiming for that. We selected for open canopies. We selected for loose clusters. We selected for moderate fertility, although we got a little carried away with a couple of them. <laughs> Uh, stuff that wasn't overly productive necessarily, but cluster morphology and upright canopy, we really focused on it as, as means of naturally controlling diseases, right? Less rot, less decay. Okay. But I think they should work on any trellis. We put them on everything from head train to fairly wide scattered um, uh, upright liars, and they've done pretty well. And, and a nice modified GBC too. And what about adaptability to changing climate? Good question. It'd be a shame if the climate change is so bad that these all fail in some way. Um, I'll be dead by then if out of town. So <laughs> that's a good question. And again, when we when we're looking at these, we're looking at acidic versions. We're looking with strong color. Those are things we're selecting for with the with the reds. Trying to think through the process. We certainly want want to to put all our eggs in a, in a more pinot like basket, which has a, in terms of higher quality, a more restricted uh, climatic, climatic zone. So, um, but we haven't really bred for that directly. 
Um, so, Andy, you mentioned, um, okay, so this is obviously pierce disease resistance. Are you planning any more varieties that would have resistance to pierce disease? Uh, we have another 30 right now in the vineyard. <laughs> we have another 15 at FPS uh, uh, awaiting uh, registration certification. So, so this is an interesting question. Um, when I told the nurseries what I was doing, and they said, well, we just need two. We need a white one and a red one and forget the rest. <laughs> if you tell any winemaker that you have 50 PD resistant wine grapes with all different styles and nuances, they say, we want them all, <laughs> right? And you can't have them all. So we're, we're trying to be a bit more strict with our and severe with our, with our um, selection process as we move along now. And we're targeting things more carefully. But I really think it's more important at this point to get mildew resistance in these backgrounds too. And, and it's something that, that would help both aspects sell themselves, right? So if you had mildew plus PD, uh, it's almost irresistible. But in powdery mildew alone, well, we just spray. In fact, I've talked with some notable growers who tell me, we have to spray anyway. I said, well, what if you don't have to spray? <laughs> the question is not, you know, is it a good idea or a bad idea? It's, it's you're wasting money, time, and resources. And, and uh, maybe we should try to bring this into this background and have people use it more effectively. I don't know. So if anybody has questions, feel free to just speak up or put them in chat or raise your hand or whatever works for you. Um, so Andy, I know, you know, in, in academic circles, uh, everybody seems to be talking about CRISPR as a way of editing genes. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that as opposed to introducing new genes from other places and things like that. And, and what, what would those great varieties be called as a practical, not practical and so forth? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm getting close to being a troglodyte now. So it's, you know, life looks good on the other, other side. But CRISPR, if you have the genes in place, if you're actually turning things on and off and they function, that's one perspective. And it turns out a lot of stuff works that way. That's the way we thought the PD resistance worked initially. And when we put in the single gene without the associated factors, nothing happened. So we didn't really know what to augment, what not to augment. We eventually decided to take different promoters and a lot of DNA around that resistance gene, and stick it all together and stick it in the plant and see what happens. And it worked to some extent, not, not as well. Um, but we're not really, we're augmenting, we're not really manipulating, right? We're not, we're not switching something on or off. And the case of powdery mildew, we may actually be switching things on and off. Um, it, it seems to be a more precise response and there might be a way. I think in terms of, of responding, um, if looking at pathways in terms of acidity, for instance, and color, other things, you, you could actually envision where you would augment again, turn things up on and off and, and modify <coughs> it internally. Um, CRISPR is going to be slow to catch on probably. I, I think it, 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 it'll go through a phase like almost everything in biotech where this is solving the world's problems. And then you realize, oh, it didn't work the way we thought it would work. <laughs> and you go back and you rethink and, and there's aspects you glean from that that are going to be important to move us forward, but other parts that will be more, more frustrating probably. So I don't know, good. it's a good question. For sure it's going to happen. Um, uh, there's been a lot of effort and, and uh, money being put into it. And, and again, I think the promise is beyond the ca capacity to, to deliver, but it'll depend on what it's working on. It's certainly been an amazing scientific tool. Okay. So Andy, I have three more questions here in the chat. Let's see how quick you can answer them. Okay. Number one, you mentioned that these vines tolerate PD presence. Does that mean these vines can act as a source of inoculum within the vineyard, heightening the pressure for non-resistant vines? So remember, the first thing we selected for was resistance uh, and high resistance. And each of these plants that are resistant, that don't get disease, actually have a different response to the bacteria. Some of them hold a lot of bacteria in the plant, some of them don't. We've selected for the ones that don't. <laughs> so we, we've not selected for the things that are tolerant. We've selected for the <coughs> materials. And now we're selecting for other forms of resistance to put together with the resistant materials. So we have even more uh, high level resistance in these backgrounds. And um, uh, it's, it's surprising the range of responses the, between stuff that is, is more like uh, Lenoir. So Lenoir and Blanc de Bois are, are intermediate. Uh, they, they're at the, they're at the 50% level if you want to look at their resistance. 
uh, whereas these materials are close to the 95, 98% material that we're looking at now. They truly are resistant. We can't get the bacteria out of them. Um, and we have stuff that's very, very susceptible and still doesn't die. And they have no, no resistance uh, even, and they're fully tolerant, uh, but, but they're, they're a different sort of plant. So. But we've been intentionally avoiding those because you're right. I think they would act as a, a corridor from the native habitat in, into vineyards that act as additional host plants. Um, do you want me to ask the question, Dave? Go ahead. Um, Andy, can you quickly talk about the difference of PD resistance on the clusters versus the leaves and the rackets? So PD, the biggest problem with PD is it kills the plant. <laughs> That's mostly internal in the stem. Um, and how, it's, how it resists the bacteria, we don't really know yet, but it prevents it from moving. So when we look at these plants, when we inoculate them, we use a needle and we pinprick through a little drop of uh, bacterial suspension and the hydraulic flow of the plant sucks that right into the, into the stem. It's pretty remarkable. Almost makes a little whooshing noise if you had a good, good enough earphones on. And it pulls it right into the plant and it, it stays there and it stays in that xylem vessel and sometimes in that connected series of xylem vessels. And over the next 10 weeks, we might see a symptom on the highly resistant plants on one leaf. And that's the leaf that was at the end of that connected bundle of xylem. So it's not moving laterally somehow. It's not going across the xylem bundle and choking off the entirety of a stem. It's just choking off one little vessel, right? So it's, it's, it's different. It's fascinating, actually. It's sort of a, a neat, neat phenomenon. Uh, I was just, uh, Andy, I was just corrected. I said PD. The question was actually related to powdery mildew. Ah, powdery mildew, yeah. Powdery mildew has a hypersensitivity response at its highest level. Uh, and then it also has gradations. So some of these things, the, the, the spore from the, from the mildew gets on a leaf, it, it forms a little penetration peg, and it goes into that cell. And then the plants have this hypersensitivity response, which is pretty common across the mildew resistances. That cell dies. So when you have, it, when you have a, uh, a, that form of resistance, you'll see a bunch of little freckles, tiny freckles on the leaf surface, where those cells have killed themselves to prevent the, the powdery mildew from establishing. We also have stuff that limits the spread of the developing mildew body on the leaf, that it slows it way down. Other stuff that, that seems to knock back the, the, the ability of those things to sporulate, to form more spores and to, to develop somewhere else. But the most common form and, and um, most easily understood form so far are these hypersensitivity responses. And that's where most of those resistance genes that people are working on do. And if you remember the slide that showed the picture of all the flagpoles, they're all on different genes. So it's really bizarre. They're scattered all across the genome. And sometimes they're in these hyper, these hyper variable regions where the genes are repeated over and over and over again. And they're, they're malleable. They're, they change with the evolutionary process as, as the different strains come up or they overcome those strains too. So we have, we have two questions in two minutes. So let's see how quickly we can go. <laughs> Um, so will you elaborate on the idea of introducing one gene via engineering versus classical breeding that brings baggage? What might be the mechanism mechanisms by which there is impact of that baggage? Um, I don't know who asked that question, but if they're a good winemaker, if, if you have a glass of wine with me, we can talk about this whole process. It's a very long, long answer. Um, it's almost impossible. It's more of an argument than an answer. <laughs> we can discuss, discuss those aspects too. But uh, so, so for genetic engineering, the, the, the hope was, and still is to some extent, that you can take a single gene or a single promoter of that gene and stick it in some background and cause it to do something. And it frankly doesn't work that well. It works for a few viruses. There's a few notable examples. Papaya mosaic virus in, in Hawaii is a, is a pretty amazing one. Um, but there really aren't that many examples uh, that where we've had success. We've had uh, the family, family resistance gene has been tampered with, and that, that's for the virus, for the coprotein of the virus. Put that in the plant and somehow it magically sort of inoculates it, uh, prevents it from, from, uh, uh, from, from uh, developing uh, family in those, in those backgrounds. Uh, but but there haven't, it hasn't worked that well, it hasn't been stable in the environment, and, and we haven't really effectively done it uh, over time with mildew yet. So we'll see. And the whole GMO story is a much longer philosophical discussion than like it's, I don't know. So, so the last question, um, and maybe this is a, I don't know if this is a fast answer or not. The use of PD resistant grapes would suggest not to use 
it em imidacloprid. Uh -huh. <laughs> pronouncing that correctly. Should have let yeah. Anita read that one. Perfectly. And, and the question though is, I missed the question though. The, the use of uh, PD resistant grapes would suggest that you don't need to use that pesticide. Uh huh. So that pesticide that that's that's maybe true, right? And we don't know to what extent the the leafhoppers really fully reproduce and go wild. And the sharpshooters go wild on on vinifera. It, it varies a lot. We know that. Uh, we know that on on citrus, the glassy wing sharpshooter thrives and is there in abundance. Yet vineyards nearby would have some, but not as much. Uh, so we don't know what those relationships are. So I don't know if that would 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 vary the way you use metoclopred. Uh, we yes, inoculate them. So we, we in the sites the, we had a site at um, Yauntville for years and years, uh, ten years that Behringer let us use very kindly. It was a nice nice gesture, and we were able to do whatever we wanted. We went through and stuck those plants a hundred times, and we spread the bacteria all over the place. We grew, <laughs> and we didn't really see. Um, those plants as good hosts for the vector. It was a different sort of situation. We could inoculate them, but I don't know. And that would be, I mean, the imidacloprid is going to be there as we try to prevent the movement of that vector from the south to the north. It's still well established. It's, it's native now. We accept the fact that it exists and well, it's, it's not an exotic pest anymore. So if we want to limit the spread both on landscape materials and on, in horticultural senses, it's probably not a bad idea to have at least monitoring of the vector and targeted spraying of the vector over time. Um, theoretically, maybe at the, at the most uh, pie in the sky sort of perspective, if you did have that resistance gene in all the plants that was host, <laughs> that host the, the glassing sharpshooter, then maybe you wouldn't have to worry about it moving and spreading at all in those cases, but that seems to me risky. Well, I think uh, that music means that we've come to the end of uh, another Office Hours with Dave and Nita. So I'd like to thank uh, Andy, our speaker, for a great presentation and answering all those questions. My pleasure. I'd like to thank all of you guys for uh, attending. Um, especially like to thank Karen Block uh, for helping to organize all of these office hours. Uh, we don't uh, do anything but show up and ask questions. So I appreciate that Karen is there to help organize. And now with Caroline, Furman joining us. Um, she's been helping tremendously to organize these sessions. She's the one that's putting all those links in the in the chat, so you can see links for um, for information on the grape rise that Andy talked about today, and also a link for where you can find the recording if you want to listen to it again or share it with others um, on Aggie Video. And so with that, we're we're going to be taking a probably a break until after harvest at this point with these um, office hours programs. We know you guys have a lot to think about and certainly with COVID and the fires, you have even more to think about. So um, we appreciate you being here today. Uh, you will be getting emails from Karen and Caroline um, and our whole extension team on when our next programs are coming up as we, uh, after we get towards the end of harvest this year. So again, we appreciate all of you attending. Um, and if you have any questions for us, feel free to e email me or Anita. You can email Andy directly. Um, certainly you can email Karen Block um, at klblock at ucdavis.edu. And she can always find uh, the right person to answer your question. So with that- I'm A. Uh, Walker, A. Walker at ucdavis.edu. There you so. go. You may not get a response, quick response, but you usually get a response. <laughs> All right, great. Stay safe, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone. See you next time.